Okay, who's going to pray us in? Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you that even though COVID is spreading and restrictions are spreading, we thank you that we're still able to get together and learn more about you. Please bless all of us, all of the people that aren't here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 What a crazy time. So, if everybody saw the email, uh, we cannot worship live on Sunday. So, we're going to go back to Facebook Live at 10 o'clock. And I was looking at the dates, and our last live worship in March was March 15th. <laughs> and our last live worship in November was November 15th. Oh. So, you know how much we love numbers in, our, in the Bible, so it must mean <laughs> something. Kind of weird. <clears throat> kind of weird. Kind of weird, but we'll make it. We'll get through this. So Matthew 19 and 20. So this is, these are the last two chapters before we get into Holy Week. Holy Week is in chapter 21. It starts already. And that's where things get rough. So that's what we'll, we'll be seeing, not next week, We'll see it the week after, because next week we're taking a week off for our Thanksgiving. I have to head down to Champaign for another meeting, so uh, time is tight. Time is tight. So, Matthew 19, Jesus leads off with divorce. So we're told, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Now, this... Jesus very seldom goes into Judea. Uh, the, actually, the last time he was in uh, Judea before now was when Joseph took Jesus, Mary, and the family out because he was afraid of Herod's brother who took power. So Jesus is just coming back to Judea. And once again, we know when he comes into this area near Jerusalem, he's going to be in danger, as we'll see in chapter 21. Uh, once again, Gary prepared a nice section of questions and answers for 19 and uh, 20. And from Gary's notes, we see that this area is called Perea. Now, nowhere in the Bible is it called Perea. It's usually called either beyond the Jordan or Transjordan. And we've seen that a lot in the Bible, Transjordan. Uh, it's a small strip near the Jordan River. And it's the, the Jewish region. So Jesus is back with the Jewish people, away from the, uh, the Gentiles. So whenever Jesus goes near the Jewish people, we've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And of course, some Pharisees are there to try to trap Jesus. Because their whole purpose is to get rid of Jesus so they can stay in power. So they're trying to trick him. They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And, of course, there's two um, schools of thought at this time amongst the Jewish leaders. Um, we know that most Jewish people believe that the man can divorce the woman for just about whatever reason he wants. If she puts too much salt in the food, she's out. <laughs> but they still want to trap Jesus because the other thought is that you've got to be very specific or you can't even have divorce. Um, the, there's two interpretations of Deuteronomy where divorce comes from. Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1 says, Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. So one interpretation supported divorce for any reason. And you can kind of see that because the words say, if she does not please him, and he discovers something wrong with her. It's not specific. It just says something. The other school of thought was um, divorce is only allowed in cases of unfaithfulness, which is logical. You know, if one, the man or the woman's unfaithful, then they should be able to get divorced. So they're trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus replies, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. And he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So Jesus is saying, God put 
man and woman together forever. They're one. They're no longer two people. They're one. And God did this, so you shouldn't ever be able to divorce people. Um, and that's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. <coughs> and then the one flesh, that's Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And we know the Genesis story where God took um, Adam's rib and then made the woman from that. So he really, uh, she came from him and became one with him again. Uh, bah, 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 bah. And then Jesus wraps it up saying, What God has joined together, let no one separate. So, in answering the Pharisees, Jesus goes away from the ruling of man, which was divorce, something man made up, and he's quoting what God says. God says, I put you together, you're going to stay together forever. And then Jesus goes on in verse 8 and says, Moses permitted you guys to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Moses knew that the Jews wanted to divorce their wives and there's nothing he was going to be able to do about it. And actually, the divorce decree was kind of a step up because at that time, remember, women were just property and men could do whatever they wanted to. But the divorce decree said, okay, you can get divorced but you've got to give her dowry back to her, and by being divorced, she's allowed to remarry. So the divorce decree, even though, even if it was for any reason, was actually a good thing for the woman at that time. So it was kind of a step up. And it was only the Jewish people that had this divorce decree. The other countries, the other peoples, they could do whatever they wanted to. Now, it's okay with the church for divorce today, correct? Right, right. It's still okay um, in the churches. Not that I'm asking for me. No, I know. <laughs> I'm just asking in general. Yeah. Um, in every church, it's still okay to divorce. Okay. Um, Except the Catholic Church. Yeah, Catholic Church, you know, if you get divorced, you can't go to communion anymore. Um, you still can go to the church, but you can't take communion. And you can never remarry in the Catholic Church. Unless you get an annulment. Right. And you got to pay extra money, of course. you got to find the right priest, too. you got to find the right priest. <laughs> yeah. To so, take it under the table. Yeah, it, everything's okay. different. And even, you know, in a Methodist church, they would never, in the past, they wouldn't allow pastors to get divorced. But now... Kind of like the Baptist church. But now... We see it. Anything mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. Anything goes. Um, as a matter of fact... Um, Still, in the, the Book of Discipline, a pastor is not supposed to uh, have premarital sex. And it says right there in the Book of Discipline, if you're a pastor and you have to be married, you can't live with somebody. But of course we know that exists. nobody holds true to those right. rules either. Anyway, I digress. Um, no, I'm sorry. I just no, no, that's good. Hmm. That's good. Because those are, those are valid questions. Because if, if we held to the Bible in Jesus' words, mm -hmm. we wouldn't allow divorce. Right. Um, and maybe we would take marriage a little bit more seriously. So, um, it's not a bad thing. No. It's not a bad thing. Um, in verse 9, Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So Jesus is taking the viewpoint that if your wife isn't unfaithful, and you just divorce her for any other reason, then you're going to commit adultery. So Jesus is really serious about this. And because, of course, adultery was subject to stoning back then. Mm. So if you got caught, it's uh, And then the, the disciples say to him, well, if, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, is it better not to marry? So they're, they're thinking, well, if we don't have a way out, why get married? So they're looking at it from a purely humanistic standpoint. Well, we should have all the flexibility in the world. And Jesus says, no, it's not, that's not the way it should be. Um... And then Jesus gets into how some people um, 
might have to live like Unix in order for this, uh, in order to serve God better. So is that where the priests became celibate? Yeah, yeah. And even Paul said that in um, in First Corinthians, because Paul never married. And Paul said, if you can be married and still serve God fully, then do it by all means, because that's what God intended. God always intended that men should marry, uh, marry and marry women. Men should marry women, women should marry men, and they should procreate. That's what God always intended. But Jesus is saying, if you can serve God better by not being married, then do that. Mm -hmm. And Paul kind of backed him up. Um, because we know from the people we've seen that it takes a very special type of person to be the spouse of a pastor. Mm -hmm. Because the pastor is called to be a pastor, and um, we know it, we feel it, we know that this is the only thing we should be doing in our life, but their spouses have never been called. So they're just kind of along for the ride, and they have to suffer all the, the slings <laughs> and arrows. Be nice. <laughs> so, so thank you, hon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that's divorce. Jesus says it shouldn't happen, and I have the same attitude. Um, and that's when, whenever I, whenever I'm asked to marry somebody, um, I make them meet with me for five times, and we go through a book. We go through a lot of serious discussions because I tell the the, the couple, I said, I want to make sure that you know what you're getting into. So we go over finances, we go over family relationships, we go over. Um, how to deal with your family once you get married, that you can't go running back home. And um, it's a, a pretty intense five sessions because I want to make sure that they, they know what they're getting into. So, um, so that's it. Jesus says no divorce. Um, the little children and Jesus. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. Now this in itself is really outrageous because at the time people viewed children just like they viewed women they're just property and actually children were like the lowest of the low um, they were good for nothing they couldn't help in the fields yet so until they're of age they're useless but here the people actually brought their children to Jesus so he could pray for them and this is Jesus reinforcing that the whole family should, should worship. They should all come together, they should all worship together, and we shouldn't have any segregation. Because, of course, back in the day, the men got to worship, and the women and children had to sit outside the temple. They couldn't come in to worship. And Jesus says that's not the way it should be. Everybody was created by God, men, women, and children, and they should all worship. But the disciples rebuked them. Once again, this proves that the disciples haven't learned their lessons. They're not listening to what Jesus is saying. Because back in, in Matthew uh, 18, chapter just before this, Jesus told him, anybody who causes a child to stumble should be tossed in the river. But the guys, the disciples, just haven't learned. So, what do we see so far in chapter 19 about the disciples? They're clueless. Clueless. <laughs> they had a lot to learn. They had a lot to learn. How about you guys? What What do we see in the disciples so far in chapter 19? They all have their mics off. Oh. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, well, the good news for the disciples is Matthew is really easy on them. Once we get to Mark, we'll see someone who's really hard on the disciples. And you'll see a different kind of uh, experience. So, the rich and the kingdom of God. Now, in this section, this is where some people misinterpret that God says money is bad. And that's not what God is saying at all. Verse 16. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked him, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, here's, here's a clue. Whenever we see the word teacher, that's somebody who's not a believer yet. 
They're coming to Jesus, and they're just asking him a general question. The believers, when they talk to Jesus, they'll, they'll call him Lord, because they understand who Jesus is. How so, about if they use the term rabbi? Rabbi, that's the um, same thing. They're saying teacher. Oh, okay. So rabbi, teacher, same thing. Um, what good thing, he's looking for one thing, must I do to get eternal life? So he's stuck in the old Jewish idea. I have to do things to get saved. I have to keep all the commandments. I have to do this. I have to do that. And Jesus says, why do you ask me what is good? Um, and here Matthew is kind of rewriting what's in Mark. Because in Mark, supposedly Jesus says, why do you call me good? And Matthew wants to make sure that there's no confusion that Jesus is not good. Okay? Matthew's whole purpose is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for. So sometimes they'll rewrite a little bit of what Mark says. Um, Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. So, but... Basically, Jesus replies the same thing. Only God is good. So, in summary, you can't do anything to save yourself. You can't do, no matter what you do, you're not going to be saved. And Jesus says, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Keep the Ten Commandments. Um, and the guy says, which ones? Well, Jesus says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so, the young man saying, okay, well, I do all these things, but what else can I do? We know that the only way into heaven is to humbly submit to Jesus. And that's what Jesus comes up with with his next answer. Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go, sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So Jesus says, no matter what you do, you can keep all the Ten Commandments, that's not going to be it. You've got to leave your entire life behind you and follow me. Well, the young guy can't do that. Where else did we get the idea that would back up verse 22? When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What other idea do we see in the gospel that kind of backs this up? Something about you can only have one master. I'm waiting for Gary. He's the only one oh. with his mic off or on. Good night. I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> I hear you, Gary. Me too. So what Jesus is saying is, if you, if you love money, you can't love me. Because basically, if we're so focused on, on our money, on our worldly possessions... We're not putting Jesus first. And that, of course, breaks one of the commandments. Thou shalt have no gods before me. So, it, see, no matter where we're at, things continue to tie together. We have to, to follow Jesus. We can't focus on our wealth. It goes back to the Ten Commandments. But Jesus is asking for something a little, little bit more even. Follow me. Surrender everything you have to me. And this is the concept of Jesus. Master of two masters. Right, exactly. That's the whole concept of Jesus is Lord. And when we say Jesus is Lord, we mean Jesus is Lord over our entire life. No exceptions. So we can't say, well, Jesus is Lord except I want to have a girl on the side. Or Jesus is Lord except I'm not going to worship. Or I'm not going to pray. No, he's got to be the entire focus of our life. And that's what Jesus is wrapping up right here. Then Jesus says to his disciples, Truly I tell you, so truly I tell you, we're in for something good. Mm -hmm. We should start paying attention. 
It is hard for someone who is rich to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Is Jesus saying only poor people get to heaven? No, because rich people would have a hard time giving up their money right. to get to heaven. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what Jesus is saying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes rich people are so focused on their stuff, like I said before, that they can't give up any of it. But of course, there's some rich people who give away a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, they would get into heaven because they're so focused on Jesus. So it's not the fact that they're rich. It's not the fact that they have a lot of stuff. It's what their focus is. Mm -hmm. So if their focus is on Jesus, no problem. Billy Graham, because of his preaching, he did pretty well. He made a lot of money. But with what he did, his whole focus was on God. Now, I don't know a lot about Joel Olstein. But something tells me that if somebody's living, if a preacher's living in a house that big, there's got to be something wrong. Got the good rings on the finger. I, see, I never even saw that. He's got rings on his fingers? No. That's that's one of the things, though. <laughs> we had a, a black gentleman, and he'd, he'd do para parodies of some of these. Oh, okay. <laughs> Preachers? <laughs> oh, yeah. I yeah don't, I've so. never seen him preach so no maybe we'll watch him tonight see what he's like. no no it's just all happy 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 yeah yeah isn't it, it based on prosperity prosperity right the it, prosperity gospel yeah, yeah. yeah that um god intends for everybody to be happy if you pray to god for wealth he'll give you wealth eh, it doesn't work that way no. plus if you send him a couple thousand you'll be even happier <laughs> right. so, that's the way he works okay so Jesus isn't saying that rich is bad. He's just saying, what's your focus? If your focus is on me and serving my people, no problem. You're okay. And to make his point... Love of money. Yeah, go ahead. What, Gene? It's the love of money. Right, exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Good point. So in verse 24, Jesus makes it obvious. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. We know that it's impossible for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. But anyway, uh, let's see, what's the clarifying point here? Oh, the prosperity gospel, okay. Uh, then the disciples, when they heard this, they're, they're confused, as always. They were greatly astonished and asked, well, then who can be saved? And... Jesus couldn't have said it more perfectly in verse 26. With man, this is impossible. But with God...